computing in plain English. Uh, chapter five, I believe, although this is episode six, because we did a two-parter a while back. Uh, so this is shared memory multi-threading. Uh, and so now we're going to actually get to doing parallelism on multiple cores. Up till now, all of the parallelism we've been talking about has been on a, within a single core. So now we're going to start digging into multiple cores. Here's the usual stuff, the experiment, and mute yourself, and download the slides, and Zoom, and YouTube, and Twitch, and Wowza, and phone grid, and mute yourself, and send questions to supercomputing in plain English at gmail.com. Supercomputing in plain English, all one word. Calendar release form. Oh, um, one change to the schedule. Uh, so two weeks from now, we're going to have two weeks off because I'm going to be out on business travel on the 13th. I'm going to be gone that whole week. Uh, and then uh, we'll have OU spring break the week after. It just doesn't seem right to hold it during spring break because people might not be able to be here. And then we'll pick it up from there. So we now no longer have a slot that says to be announced because we've used them all up. Uh, and I sure hope I don't get any more Tuesday travel the rest of the semester. Okay, thanks for helping, all the people who helped, experiment, coming. Okay, we'll talk about parallelism in a general way, then we'll talk about, yes, question from Tina. Okay, I'm, I'm seeing Henry is in, in a smaller window, picture to picture with a big recording word on the other half. Uh, and then they're also saying Zoom's, he's seeing it, he needs to see it in a full screen, he's only seeing a small screen. Hang on, I'm not sure why that's small, but. Uh, hang on, speaker view. There we go. That might be the issue. Ask them if that's any better. Speaker view, is that improved? Some of you folks have any opinions on that? Much better. Yes, fixed. Okay, good. All right. Thank goodness. It's always something. See, it's an experiment. Okay. Um, and then we'll talk about OpenMP, which is a particular way to do shared memory and parallelism. So we remember in the distant mists of time five weeks ago, we said that parallelism is doing multiple things at the same time. Um, and we, uh, we really want to start thinking about that in more concrete terms now. We've seen instruction level parallelism where the parallelism is using multiple components of the same CPU core. Now we're going to look at multiple CPU cores in the same PC, in the same server computer. And then starting next week, we'll look at multiple computers working together. But today is multiple cores of the same, in the same box. Uh, so it could be on the same chip or could be multiple chips in the box. Usually nowadays, more often than not, you get like two chips in the box uh, sometimes four, very occasionally eight, and once in a while one, but more often than not, you have a couple of chips in the box. Yeah. So what you have is you have different parts of the machine either doing the same thing to different data or doing different things to the same data or some combination of that. Okay. And it turns out that there are more and more kinds of parallelism. You know, in the olden days, before my long white beard made it all the way down to the floor, um, we used to just have instruction level parallelism and maybe some multi-threading. Think back to like the 1970s, we might have two or maybe even four CPUs in the box, and that was the extent of the parallelism we were gonna get. Um, and then as we got into the 80s and especially in the 90s, we started doing multiple boxes that would be hooked together. And so we got to distributed parallelism, uh, which we're going to start on with, uh, next week. Um, and then more recently, really in the last mm, decade or so, uh, maybe a little more than a decade, we've gotten into accelerator parallelism, where you drop some kind of magical card into your box. Uh, and that magical card can do lots of number crunching very quickly. Okay. Now, here's where it gets tricky. So now we can start playing mix and match with those, where we would have a GPU card or some other accelerator card, um, and we would have, say, multiple threads. So perhaps you have a couple of different threads, each one of which is talking to a different 
um, accelerator card, or perhaps you'd have multiple servers talking to different accelerator cards. You might have a big pile of accelerator cards. In fact, some of the biggest supercomputers in the world today are a bunch of servers, each of which has, say, a couple of accelerator cards, and you've got a zillion of these servers, you've got a zillion accelerator cards, if you want to run a really big problem, you're running it over lots and lots of these cards. And so this hybrid parallelism is becoming more and more common now. Um, and that, of course, makes the code trickier to write. All right, so why do we like parallelism? Well, we already said, you know, there's the forest and the trees. The trees, we like being able to run the same problem faster. But better than that, is being able to run bigger problems in the same amount of time. So, you know, we had that example the first week about, well, what if I could do something on my laptop in a month or on the supercomputer in an hour? Well, if you're already resigned to waiting a month for your result, but you can run it on the supercomputer in an hour, then you can do a problem, and I'll do the math for you, 24 times 30 days. So that's 720 times bigger than the problem you could do just on your laptop. Um, and so that's a big win, because the bigger the problems you're solving, the more exciting the results, uh, where exciting could be you get more publications or you uh, earn more money, whatever it is. Yeah. All right, now some jargon. Um, so you're going to hear people use the words threads and processes more or less interchangeably. Technically, they are not the same thing. Technically, they are two different things. When you have a bunch of threads, that means that they can look at and typically even change the values of each other's variables. So they share a bunch of memory that they can all look at and all change. Um, so this is called an address space. So they have a shared address space. Typically, though not invariably, typically that shared address space is a physical memory that they all physically have access to, but it's not guaranteed that that's true. There are software technologies that let you um, bring a bunch of servers together to pretend to be one big server. So it's not necessarily physically the case. Okay, processes, they each have their own private address space, their own private area of memory with their own private variables that only they can see and only they can change. And nobody else can see or change anything in the private memory. Okay? So technically, threads have a shared address space. Technically, processes have uh, private address spaces. In practice, you will hear people use these words interchangeably. That's not great. It's never good when we confuse each other, but that's the reality that you're going to deal with. So technically, multi-threading means parallelism by multiple threads, so multiple threads that all share the same address space multiprocessing, multiple processes that each have their own private address space. So generally, when we talk about shared memory parallelism, we're talking about multi-threading. Generally, when we talk about distributed parallelism, we're talking about multi-processing. But again, you can't count on people using those terms technically correctly. So there's always going to be confusion. And this is why I kind of have this here. And in fact, the following terms are all used pretty much interchangeably out there in the wild. Um, parallelism, concurrency, which is a superset of parallelism. So most concurrency is not parallel. So for example, time slicing, where you're doing this for a while, and then you switch over and do this, and then you switch over and do this, and then you come back and do this for a while again. And by the way, the definition of a while is a tiny fraction of a second, okay? Um, concurrency includes parallelism. Think of parallelism as a degenerate case of concurrency, but is not the same thing as parallelism. It's more general. Um, Multi-threading, multiprocessing, all these terms, although they all have technically different meanings, you will hear all of them used to mean the same thing, to mean random things, and you will not know until either A, you ask for clarification, or B, you listen to that person ramble on long enough eventually you'll figure out which of these they really mean. And it will do you no good to correct them because they will forget. And also they won't appreciate being corrected. No one likes being corrected. Okay, um, Andal's Law. So this goes all the way back to when I was mumble years old, a little tiny knee-high to a grasshopper fellow. Uh, this person who was already an adult by then, uh, Gina Andal, he came up with this law. And who knew there was going to be math, right? Okay. 
So you can ignore all the math and think about the actual implications of Amdahl's law. So the idea is that um, any code has a part of the code that can be parallelized and a part of the code that can't be parallelized. And the problem is, no matter how many processors you throw at the part of the code that can be parallelized, the part of the code that can't be parallelized can't be parallelized, which means you can throw as many processors as you want at it. It's still going to take the same amount of time. Okay? Um, so the serial, the non-parallel part, um, is going to take the same amount of time no matter what. And pretty much every code has a serial part somewhere. Okay? So the maximum speed up you can get is that the parallel part takes zero time. And the serial part takes the same amount of time it takes, no matter what. Okay. So um, here's kind of a picture of that. So if the fraction of the code that cannot be parallelized, that is serial, is 10%, then the absolute maximum speed up you can get is a factor of 10, no matter how many processors you throw at it. Because if you throw so many processors at the parallel part that its time goes to zero, which, by the way, does not happen in real life, but let's pretend that its time went to zero, you still got 10% of it that can't be sped up by throwing more processors at it. So that 10% is now 100% of runtime. So you sped it up by a factor of 10, and that's all you're going to get. Right? Now, way out here, I've got, oh, I can do, um, I can speed up, I can parallelize all but 10 to the minus 10 of the code. Well, that's great. That means the maximum you're going to get out of it is a factor of 10 to the 10 speed up. Right? Now, in real life, you rarely get a factor of 10 to the 10 speed up. That's a factor of 10 million, but occasionally that will happen. All right, so here's kind of an example of this. I'll show you the Fortran version, but for the folks who do C at home, here's C or C++ or Java. Okay, so here's a little code. The red bit is the part that can't be sped up by throwing more processors at it. So it's going to take however long it takes, right? And then here I'm doing some calculation, and it's going to, I could throw lots of processors at it and get it to speed up a lot, but it's not going to, even if this is so sped up that it takes basically zero time, I still got that to deal with. Okay. And that's more or less real life. Okay. So the fraction of the code that can be parallelized is the limiting factor to how much speed up you can get. Okay. Now, None of this takes into account the fact that anytime you parallelize, there's overhead. We remember this from the first week, right? When we were doing the jigsaw puzzle and there was contention for the shared resource and there was communication of shared interfaces, right? That overhead is going to be there too, but we're not even paying attention to that right now. We're pretending that doesn't exist. We still have this problem that the serial part takes however long it takes. Okay. Now, our goal, what we want, is for parallelism to get us as much speed up as possible. Um, the ideal is linear speed up. That means that the speed up is proportional to the number of processors. In real life, that is rare. Now, technically, it can happen, and occasionally it does, that you get what's called super linear speed up, um, or some people like to say supra linear speed up because they have their snoots in the air a little bit. Um, but super linear speed up, meaning if you throw 10 processors at it, it speed up, speeds up by, say, a factor of 12. That's pretty rare. It does happen. Typically, when it happens, it's because you're getting better reuse of cache because the problem that you have per processor starts to fit in the cache, which maybe it didn't originally. But that's, again, it's pretty rare. Linear speed up is hard enough to achieve, and usually you don't get it. All right, so here's a picture of that. This is an old code on an old machine, but it so beautifully illustrates the principle I'm getting at that I've kept it for years and years. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful graph. So um, this is on different kinds of machines. And as I'm adding more processors, and by the way, growing the problem size proportional to the number of processors, um, I'm seeing that I'm spending more and more time doing overhead. So here's what it takes if I'm running on a single processor. It's 40 seconds. And if I'm running on, what is this, 128 processors, it's about 51 seconds. So 11 of those seconds are spent doing parallel overhead. Right? So I'm not getting perfectly linear speed up. But it's not bad. At 128 processors, I've got about 25% overhead. That's not the end of the world. Okay. 
Uh, and that's not that unusual either. All right, now, there are two kinds of speed up or scalability. Scalability is just a highfalutin word for it runs faster if there are more processors. Okay. Uh, strong scalability, by the way, is the less useful version. Weak scalability typically is the more useful version. Strong scalability is um, if I keep the problem size fixed, but I throw more processors at it, it runs faster. Weak scalability is if I increase the problem size proportional to the number of processors, it takes the same amount of time. It doesn't take long. Okay. So in real life, typically weak scalability, ironically, is more valuable because what we actually want to do is run bigger problems. Sometimes we want the same problem to run faster, but oftentimes we want to be able to run bigger problems, and that's where weak scalability. All right, so this graph that I was just showing you, this is an example of weak scalability, where the size of the problem grows with the number of processors. Okay. Granularity. Um, so we talked about parallel overhead, about contention and communication. Um, the difficulty is, particularly with communication, the smaller the thing that each processor gets, the smaller the amount of work that each processor gets, the higher the proportion, the higher the fraction of runtime that processor will spend dealing with the parallel overhead, dealing with particularly communication, um, although in some cases contention as well. Um, and so you, in practice, you generally want to have what's called coarse grain parallelism, where each processor gets a big chunk of work to do. And that way, the amount of overhead per unit of work is kept low. If you go to fine grain, where each processor gets a little bit of work to do, then the um, fraction of runtime that's spent doing the, the parallel overhead and not getting work done goes up. Okay. So we generally like coarse grain better than fine grain. There have occasionally been, like back in the early 90s, you could buy supercomputers that were designed for fine grain parallelism. Today, you can argue that the that some of the um, accelerators like the graphics cards and whatnot are designed for fine grain parallelism. But more often than not, you're better served by having your parallelism as coarse as possible. Question from TV land. It says, would it be possible to improve the slides focus? which looks pretty fuzzy through YouTube. Is it possible to improve the slides focus? The only way to do that is to turn the light back there down to three. And we'll see. So um, the trade-off is less Henry. Uh, yeah, on the other side. Less Henry, um, but um, more contrast on the slides. We'll give it a try. That, that tells us the answer to the question we were running the experiment for today. OK, hopefully that's better. Um, because I believe the focus is automatic. So, all right. Um, overhead, I, I pretty much talked about this. Um, but so um, components to that overhead, you actually have to manage the parallelism. And in multi-threading, that management is a very active thing. You have to keep working on that as the code runs. Of course, communication among the threads or processes and then synchronization, which we'll talk about later, but synchronization means everybody waits until everybody's waiting, and then everybody can go on. Which means most of us wait for a while because there's one straggler who isn't done yet. Okay, so now let's get to shared memory multi-threading. I'm gonna skip over the jigsaw puzzle because we've already seen that. Right? That's our old friend, blah, blah, blah. So most shared memory parallelism nowadays uses something called the fork join model. So the idea is I am chugging along, doing my thing. I'm a flow of execution. And now I realize I need to do some stuff in parallel. So I am going to, and this is the actual term for this, I'm going to fork a bunch of additional threads, additional flows of execution that share the same memory with uh, and then we all are going to do stuff for a while. And then when they're done doing the stuff that needed to happen in parallel, then they are going to shut down and I'm going to continue on my merry way. So the main thread 
is going to be operating all the time. And then the child threads, as they refer to, um, will um, come and go as needed. Okay. So here's a picture of that. Right. So computing time is going downward in this picture. Okay. So I'm, I'm the main thread, sometimes referred to as thread zero, because we're computer scientists, we like to start counting zero. Thread zero is chugging along doing its thing. All of a sudden, it realizes it needs to do something in parallel. So it forks, or sometimes they say spawns, a bunch of children threads. And then all of us together will be doing our thing. And then when that parallel task is over, then they will all shut down. That's what we call join. All the children will shut down, and then I'll continue on my merry way. By the way, this can happen over and over, multiple times during the run. Okay. All right. Now, yes, question from TV Land. Yes. She said it's not encouraged. Uh, unfortunately, we are on autofocus, so um, I can't do much about that. I'm pressing the autofocus button, but it, it, it is what it is. OK. Um, so now what I just described is what happens in theory. In practice, and it's easier to see this from the picture. So this is in theory. In principle, this is what happens. Right, so um, I'm always doing my thing, and from time to time, I've got children doing stuff in parallel with me, and then I'm doing my thing by myself, and then children doing stuff in parallel with me, and then I'm doing the thing by myself, and that happens over and over and over and over. In practice, often what happens is I just fork the children at the very beginning, and then when I don't need them, they are idle; they don't do anything, and then when I do need them, then they do stuff. And the reason I want to do that is because there's an overhead cost associated with forking and an overhead cost associated with joining, whereas there isn't a lot of overhead cost associated with not doing anything. So I'll just go ahead and leave them there, and I'll reactivate them when I need them. I'll tell them to do something. But in the meantime, I'll continue on my merry way. Okay. Um, so we want to eliminate that idle cost. The, the, the other problem is, if you've got multiple programs running on the same machine, then if you give up some of the CPU cores because you're not currently doing anything in parallel, why some other program may take them. And then you ain't getting them back. Yes, question from TV Land. Well, kind of a comment that uh, even though the slides are difficult to see on the video, Remind students that the slides for each lecture are available in the link. Yes, the slides are available for download from the web page, so go there. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and this is becoming more and more of an issue because we've got more and more cores in our CPUs, right? In the olden days, in the long, long ago, before my long white beard made it all the way down to the floor, back then, Every chip was a single core. We didn't even have that word because you don't have to talk about the cores of a CPU that's only got one core. But now that we have multiple cores and more and more cores, this is a bigger and bigger issue, especially because you may remember this from the first week, you might have more cores than the maximum speed up that you're going to get out of doing shared memory parallels, out of doing multi-threading. So we talked about it's not unusual, it's fairly typical, for a shared memory parallel code to top out at like 32 cores, sometimes significantly less than that. But today, you can buy a 28 or a 32 core chip, I, uh, yeah, x86 chip from Intel or from AMD, they'll cheerfully sell you that. You put two of those in a box, right? You've got 56 or 64 cores in a box. Well, you're wasting a lot of that box if you've got a code that only speeds up up to 32 cores. If it starts slowing down after 32 cores, you got a lot of idle machinery there. Well, you might as well put somebody else's code on that box at the same time. Right? So this is becoming more and more of an issue as these chips get heftier and heftier in terms of the number of cores. Okay. Now, I added these slides in a few days ago because I realized this is an issue that everybody has encountered in some way, and it's a bit confusing. Um, so it's simultaneous multi-threading. How many of you have heard the term hyper-threading? Anybody heard that term? Okay, so hyper-threading, um, 
or and that's the Intel trade name. The generic name is simultaneous multi-threading. A lot of chips today, not every chip, the ARM chips don't do this, at least that I'm aware of. I looked on the web for information. I couldn't find any evidence that ARM chips do this, although they seem to be thinking about it now, the ARM people. Um, but certainly the x86 chips do this, Intel and AMD. Uh, the power chips from IBM do this. The Spark chips from Oracle do this. Um, where um, a CPU core can have multiple threads living on it. Now, this is somewhat of a, I want to be careful about my wording. <laughs> um, they're not, so you now have, in addition to the parallelism of multiple threads, you can have concurrency within a CPU core where you have two threads, or on other chip families even more, you have multiple threads, but they're time slicing in and out. They're sharing all of the machinery of the core with one exception, which is they each have their own set of registers, what we sometimes call a register file or register bank. So you have two, let's call them pseudo threads, although um, the chip manufacturers repeat that term, um, that sit in the CPU at the same time, but they can kick each other out and one of them will do some work for a while and then the other one will do some work for a while and back and forth and back and forth. Now this could be good or it could be bad depending on how the code is behaving. The idea is the only thing that's duplicated are the registers, the sets of registers. Um, you've got the same, like if you've got circuitry that multiplies, that circuitry is shared by those two sets of registers. And one of them can be using it or the other one can be using it, but not both at literally the same time. So again, it's not literally parallel. Um, so they're switching back and forth between the two simultaneous multi-threads, which are not exactly parallel, okay? And the reason this could be a big win is, for example, if your thread, if your flow of execution is chugging along and suddenly it needs data from RAM, well, we remember that was like a nice long wait. That was a wait of um, perhaps 100 or more nanoseconds to get uh, 64 bytes from RAM into cache, right? That's a good long time. Well, maybe while that flow of execution is waiting for data to come from RAM, maybe a separate flow of execution could be doing some calculations. Because remember, we said, you know, the amount of calculations that you can get done while waiting for one line of cache to come from RAM into cache could be hundreds of calculations. So maybe the other thread could get some work done then. Okay. Um, the problem is what happens if both of them stall waiting for RAM? Then actually things can slow down a bit. This could be a big deal. For example, if you've got um, a memory bound code, a code whose performance is limited by the speed of the memory because it's doing lots of movement between RAM and the CPU, lots of data movement, then what can happen is, A, they can both stall at the same time while waiting for data from memory, in which case they're fighting over that very limited bandwidth from RAM in the CPU. We saw that picture, really good fight, okay? And you can make it even worse because then maybe they're not getting any value out of the data they brought in from RAM into cache because while they bring something in from RAM into cache, well, the other simultaneous multi-thread is going to be bringing something else in that will clobber what they brought in. And so you can get into a situation called cache crashing, where the two, um, or perhaps several, um, simultaneous multi-threads are fighting over the cache. Right? Um, if you've got a, and that's in a, that's in a CPU bound code, if you're in, um, a memory bound code, then you can have that stalling problem. So um, what we have found empirically here, and we do, I think more than half of the work that, that people run on our supercomputer um, is memory bound. It's, it's performance is limited by the speed of the memory. Um, what we have found is most of our users don't get much, if any, value out of simultaneous multi-threading. And in fact, for a lot of them, it actually slows their code down a little bit. So um, we typically turn that off in most cases. Okay, 
And by the way, to give you the, some concrete numbers, um, the, the Intel and AMD x86 chips, um, many of them, certainly the server chips, but this is also true with a lot of the laptop and desktop chips, um, have two uh, simultaneous multi-threads per core. Uh, they, some of the less common sort of non-desktop workstation and server chips, Power and Spark, Power you get four or eight per core. Spark is up to eight, um, depending on which model chip you're looking at. Uh, Intel Itanium is two per core. And ARM, as I mentioned before, doesn't actually support simultaneous multi-threading at all, as far as I've been able to find. Um, although, again, there's discussions of the possibility of that being added in the future. But at least at the moment, it doesn't appear. Now I want to have a little bit of an aside um, because this is going to be important for the next couple of weeks, um, standards and non-standards. So a standard, so if I use the word standard as a noun, a standard is an agreed upon way to do a thing that there's some governing body, usually an international governing body, that decides this is the way this thing is going to be. So for example, the C and Fortran programming languages, there are standards. Uh, I think both of them are coming from ISO. Um, there are standards for what the language is supposed to be. And you are supposed to provide, if you're gonna create a compiler for C, for example, that compiler should conform to the standard. Now you can also add other stuff that's not in the standard. Um, but oftentimes what you want is some compiler option that says um, force the compile to conform to a particular version of the standard. Okay? Now a non-standard, on the other hand, is something that is um, particular to one group and they decide what it is and they don't care what anybody else thinks, um, although they usually do. They want to know what their customers think because they want to sell more product, um, but they are not bound by any of these international organizations. So. Um, to give some concrete examples. Um, and to make this even more fun, we're going to use standard as both an adjective and a noun. So now we know what a standard is, using the word standard as a noun, but then the adjective standard means in common use. So there are standard standards. So a standard standard, for example, is the C programming language. Um, or TCP IP, which is the protocol for doing Ethernet data communication. Right? These are standards and they're in common use. HTML is another one, right? So making web pages. Non-standard standards are standards that exist, but they're very uncommonly used. Um, so there is a, an official standard for a network flavor called Miranet. Uh, I'm not aware of any manufacturer of Miranet today. Um, and even when there was a manufacturer of Miranet, as far as I know, there was only ever one. Are you aware of anybody other than Miracom who ever manufactured? And it was a, a fast net. Um, faster than Ethernet, um, so sort of equivalent to what we have on supercomputers today. Um, and it was a standard, there was an official standard for it, but there's only one company making it. Okay. A standard non standard, so PDF is a really good example of a standard non standard. PDF is actually proprietary, the data format is proprietary. Adobe created it. Okay. There isn't a governing committee with you know, lots of different uh, interest groups participating in the development of PDF. Uh, format. Um, Windows is another good example, right? Windows is all over the place, right? Including on my laptop right here. There isn't a governing body. It's Microsoft makes all the decisions, but it is in common use. So it is a standard, non-standard. And then non-standard, non-standards are things that are very rare and there isn't a standard for them. Okay. So uh, WordStar. How many of you remember WordStar? Any of you remember WordPerfect? Okay, a couple people remember. So um, Word is the um, common uh, word processing program, but there were, and I think maybe even still are, WordStar, and Word, I'm pretty sure WordPerfect is still around. I don't know if WordStar is. Okay, so that's a non-standard, non-standard. Okay, now having gotten through all that, OpenMP. OpenMP, by the way, uh, jargon problem. Um, Next week, we're going to do MPI. There is an implementation of MPI called OpenMPI. This is OpenMP. It has nothing to do with MPI, nor OpenMPI. Nonetheless, it's so easy to get these confused. 
And I've had so many conversations with people where they referred to OpenMP as OpenMPI or vice versa. So I'm gonna try and be really consistent in how I use the term OpenMP. OpenMP is a standard for expressing shared memory multi-thread. That's what OpenMP is. It has nothing whatsoever to do with OpenMPI. And if they had asked me, I would have told them, it's too late, you can't call that thing OpenMPI because somebody already is using OpenMP and it's just gonna create confusion. But they didn't ask me and so it happened. All right, so OpenMP, you've got compiler directives, you've got some functions and you've got some environment variables. And these are all standardized. There's an OpenMP governing body. Uh, and I think it's openmp.org is the website. And you can just go there and you can download a copy of the standard. It's ironically, it's in PDF. Um, so you can download a copy of it. When you compile a program that's got OpenMP stuff in it, if your compiler knows OpenMP and you tell the compiler that you want to use OpenMP, then you get OpenMP parallelism. If you don't have a, if your compiler doesn't know OpenMP or it does know OpenMP, but you don't tell it to turn OpenMP on, then all of that gets ignored. It gets treated as comments, okay? So, by the way, this only applies to Fortran, C, and C++. Now, there is a not part of the OpenMP standard version of OpenMP for Python called uh, PyMP, and you can look that up on Google, and it's, they, they have a, a GitHub site or something. Uh, I looked at that the other day. Um, there have been multiple implementations for Java. I can't find evidence that any of them are still under active development. The youngest one I was able to find, and maybe there's one out there that I just didn't see, but the youngest one I was able to find, the last time they updated it was 2015. And to me, that sounds like no longer an active development. I could be wrong, but as far as I can tell. Now, so compiler directives, you've already seen compiler directives. Um, if you're a C programmer, you've seen things like pound include. If you're a Fortran programmer, you've seen the include statement. These are essentially the same kind of thing. They tell the compiler to do something, but it's not really exactly compiling in the most literal sense. Okay. All right, so in, in Fortran, the way you express OpenMP, um, and this corresponds to what a, what a comment looks like in Fortran 90 and later. Fortran 77, that's a bit iffy, because in the olden days, Fortran comments started with the letter C in the leftmost column. Um, now they can start with an exclamation point and typically do. So you start with that exclamation point, which means that if it's a non-OpenMP compiler or if you didn't ask for OpenMP to be used, then the compiler will go, oh, that's a comment and it will ignore it. But if you have a compiler that knows OpenMP and you said, please use OpenMP when you compile, then it'll say, oh, that's an OpenMP directive. Right? So that's convenient. Right? When you don't want it, it's not there, even though it's there. And when you do want it, it turns itself on. In C and C++, um, it's, it looks like a preprocessor directive. And in fact, it actually sort of is. Um, I don't know why it's pragma, but I did happen one time I was giving this talk and there was a person in the audience who is from Greece. And he said, oh, pragma, that's the Greek word for thing. And I said, you mean thing like stuff? And he said, that's right. So pragma, pound pragma here means thing. And it's an open MP thing, right? And then whatever the thing is. So we'll get into that. All right, so here is kind of an initial look. We're not gonna do all of these and we're gonna run out of time anyway. But here's kind of an initial look at the sort of standard uh, directives that we use in open MP. And probably the most common one is in Fortran it's parallel do, in C it's parallel for. So parallelize this loop is the most common thing you see happen in an OpenMP code. And I'll show you an example. Okay. And all the blue stuff here, by the way, is the OpenMP stuff. So I've got a couple of um, functions that I'm planning to call. OMP get max threads. So give me the number of threads I'm allowed to run on. And that's going to be set by an environment variable just before you run, but we'll get to that in a minute. And then here, for this do loop, and in C, it's going to be a for loop. Same idea there. Okay. 
it's going to do this loop in parallel. Okay? And what that means is it's going to have a bunch of threads this many. Okay? And it's going to do that many versions, that many instances of that loop, but not all the, doing the whole loop, each of them doing a subset. So here, what I in this particular example, I'm just looping over the number of threads, and the um, which thread I am starts from zero and goes to how many threads there are minus one. Okay. So loop over the threads, find out which thread am I. OMP get thread none. Who am I? Right. This is how many of us are there. This is who am I. And then just output which one we are and hello world. Right. So think of this as the OpenMP hello world version. Okay. And here's the C. Equivalent. Okay, so before we run this, we want to say how many threads we want to run on. Okay, so in this case, I said it was four, and I run it. It tells me I'm running on four threads, and then the different iterations, each one says hello world. Now notice they come out in random order. It's a different order every time. Okay, this is non deterministic. We do not know what order the output will come in, because we don't know which one's going to go first. Right? There, there's a lot of different things that could affect who goes first. So um, we had to set OMP num threads. So before we run the code, and then when we run the code, that call to OMP get max threads will return, in this case, the value 4, because that's this. OMP get max threads gives us the value of the environment variable OMP num threads. Okay. If you are a uh, bash person, that would be export OMP num threads. You know, same idea. I, I'm more of a TC shell person. Okay. So, all right. Non deterministic. Very good. Okay. So the parallel view directive just means execute this loop in parallel on however many threads have been set up. I can get into more detail. I can say, oh, do fewer threads than that. But we're not going to get into that. So do the iterations of this loop, but do them at the same time. Now, not literally all. Let's break that down and figure out what that means. All right, so suppose we want to do three iterations per thread. Well, what happens is among the threads, they happen in random order. But within each thread, they happen in the correct order. So look, 9, 10, 11, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the threads are random, but within a thread, it's deterministic. Within a thread, it's in order. Is that weird? Is that nice and weird? Okay. And in fact, what really happens is the sets of iterations of the loop are split up into what we call chunks, and I'll talk about that in a moment, split up into chunks, and then each thread iterates through the subset of iterations that belong to its chunk. Okay. So in this particular case, what we got was thread 0 got 0, 1, and 2, thread 1 got 3, 4, and 5, thread 2 got 6, 7, 8, thread 3 got 9, 10, 11, which is exactly what you would predict, right? Very straightforward. We took the number of threads we had, we had four threads, we had 12 iterations, we just split them up. Now, if it was four threads and 11 iterations, I think we'd end up with nine and 10 here for thread three, and that'd be a 10, 15 minutes? Okay, won't be nearly enough, but that's the way it is. Okay, now, um, in shared memory parallelism, there are two kinds of data. There's the um, shared data, which is exactly what we would expect from shared memory parallelism, but also you can have for each thread its own private data. You kind of have to set that up, but you can, and in fact, arguably, for a couple of variables, you must have private data for each thread. Okay? Um, and we'll get into the details of how that's worked out. When we do distributed parallelism next week, what you'll see is that in distributed parallelism, everything's private. Every distributed parallel process has its own private variables, and there's nothing shared at all. Would we want to share all the data? Well, the answer is certainly not everything. Okay. So, um, and, and by the way, so we saw in the example program, I had this little bit of, that's in here. Oh, that one, okay. 
um, we can add in more information, more attributes to our parallel do directive. And here I said, iteration and this thread are private, share, number of threads is shared. Okay. So what does that mean? Well, it means exactly what it sounds like. So everybody has the same variable named number of threads, but thread zero's version of iteration is completely different from thread one's iteration. It's completely different from thread two's iteration. They each have their own and the others can't see it. Everybody thinks they're operating on the same one, but they're actually all different ones. They actually each have their own copy. Why do we do that? Well, let's take a look here. Okay. So suppose this thread was shared. Then when you did the output, what value would this thread have? Would it have the value of the thread index of the thread that's actually doing the I.O.? Would it have some random value based on whoever updated that most recently? Well, the problem is it would have some random value. So we must, this has to be private, right? Because if they all have the same one, they're going to be clobbering each other. And you never know what's going to come out of there. So got to set it up so that this variable and that variable are not the same on the different threads. Okay. All right. Uh, I think I already talked about this. Good. Now, on the other hand, it doesn't make sense to have 32 copies of number of threads because number of threads is going to be the same for every thread, right? They're all going to say there are 32 of us or four of us or however many there are. If there are four threads, all of us should agree that there are four of us, but each one of us should know who am I. So each one of us has our own identity, but we all share how many of us there are. There are four of us. We all agree on that. Okay. So that should not be private. That should be shared. All right. Now, you can put clauses into your direct to specify this stuff. And this becomes super important as soon as the loop, the parallel do loop or parallel for loop is actually complicating when there's interesting stuff going in on in it. You have to start specifying. I want these things to be private and these things to be shared. And that's important, right? Um, and in this particular case, the example we're looking at, we want which iteration of the loop we're on and which thread we're in, we want those to be private, but the number of threads, that should be shared. Is that first good? Now, suppose I have a loop that deals with 50 different variables. Do I want to have to specify each and every one of them, or would that be way too much work and entirely too prone to introducing exciting new bugs? Too much work, too many bugs. So happily, the designers of OpenMP realized this, and they gave us the ability to say which one of these, shared or private, is the default. And then you only have to specify the other one. Okay, so if I say default private, then I only have to specify which ones are shared. If I say default shared, then I only have to specify which ones are private. Okay? And that cuts down how much specifying I need to do. It reduces the amount of labor, and the um, likelihood of introducing exciting bugs. But then there's the default default, as it were, right? So this, I am specifying which one is the default, and then I have to say which things don't fit that. But if I don't say which one's the default, then the default is shared, except for the loop iteration variable, right? So in this loop, the variable named iteration by default, thank you, by default is um, private and everything else by default is shared. Okay. So the default default is almost everything is shared but not quite. Okay. So now what about if you've got different amount of work to do depending on the particulars of an iteration of loop? So here's a nice picture of a loop over however many iterations, let's say length is a billion, that gives us plenty of time to do the work. Okay. 
I'm going to do a little divide here. And by the way, we'll get a strength reduction. We'll actually end up multiplying this by 0.3333. The compiler is smart enough to do that. Saw that in the last one. Okay, but then if that value is negative, then we're going to do this other work. Otherwise, we'll do this work. And log takes a long time, and subtract takes very little time. So now the iterations of my loop aren't the same. They don't take the same amount of time. All right. Oops, that's the same thing. I didn't see. All right, well, how are we going to handle that? Well, a quick recap. Up till now, what we said was you take the iterations of that loop, you split them up into chunks of roughly equal size, and you give a chunk to each thread, and each thread just iterates through its subset. So far, is it good? Okay. Well, if there's going to be wildly different runtime from iteration to iteration, that may not be the best way to do it. Because if you have, say, at the beginning of the array, lots of cases of doing log, and at the end of the array, only a few cases of doing log, then you know the last thread will finish way before the first thread. So that's not a win. Yes, question? If number of threads is private, that just adds an overhead, right? It doesn't really make the program output something that is wrong, right? Uh, so there's a lot of um, if and it depends to how you handle that case. Uh, I'll say that that can be true, but there are ways to screw it up. Um, and when there are ways to screw it up, you can bet that at some point you will. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Digging into the details of that is going to take more time than we've got. All right, so um, OpenMP actually provides three different approaches to splitting up the iterations among the threads in order to ensure that we get as close to the threads finishing at the same time as possible. Okay. Um, the two extremes and then the middle ground. So static is what we looked at before. We take the, the um, collection of iterations, we divide by the number of threads, and we give a chunk of roughly equal size to each thread, and they just walk through their subset of the threads. Right? Very straightforward. Dynamic is basically the exact opposite. Um, a thread will do an iteration, or perhaps a few iterations, and then it will go back and say, please, sir, I want some more. Right? Like Oliver Twist. Okay? It will request more threads to work on. The idea being, that if a particular thread gets stuck doing an iteration that takes a long time to calculate, then it'll do fewer iterations and still end up finishing at roughly the same time as everyone else. But the downside of that is now each thread has to keep going back and begging for more. And that takes time. There's an overhead cost associated with asking for more work to do. So the middle ground is what's called guided. So guided, you start with each thread gets a lot of iterations to work on. Not um, number of iterations divided by number of threads, but maybe number of iterations divided by number of threads, and then half of that, or quarter of that, or an eighth, whatever it is. And then after doing a lot of work, the thread goes back and says, please, sir, I want some more. And it gets a smaller amount of work, say half as much as it had previously done. And it does that for a while and finishes that. And then it goes back and says, please, sir, I want some more. And it gets half of that, what it had just done. So the amount of work it gets each time goes down. Five minutes? OK, I'll go over, but hopefully not too bad. So here's static, right? Everybody gets an equal amount of work to do, and you just iterate through, no big deal. This works really great when the amount of work per iteration is roughly equal, roughly constant. Okay. Here's dynamic. Everybody gets a little bit, and then they go back and beg for more. right? And so some will do tons of iterations, but the iterations they do don't take that, that much time. Others will do only a few iterations, but the iterations they do take lots of time. And they end at roughly the same time, because there's a lot of overhead. And then static. Each one starts doing a lot of iterations, but then when it finishes its set of iterations, it goes back and says, please, sir, I want some more. And then it gets fewer on the second time around, and then fewer on the third time around, and so on. 
until eventually it's just getting like one thread at a time or whatever. So I'll roll back for a second. Here, the amount of begging for more work is zero. Everybody gets a fixed amount of work and you never have to go back and ask for more. Okay. Here, the amount of begging for work is proportional to the amount of, to the number of iterations, right? Or maybe proportional to the amount of work might be a way of thinking. But then for guided, the amount of begging for more work is proportional to the law of the number of iterations. So that reduces the begging by a lot. There's a lot less parallel overhead there. Okay. So how do you know which one is the right one? Test it. You test it, exactly. And by the way, can you trust your test? No, you totally can't because A, um, you will have to come up with a typical case that looks like the kinds of cases you're going to be running in production, which you'll be wrong. And even if you're right today, tomorrow you'll do something different, so you'll still be wrong. And B, we went through the, you know, it's the version of the, it's the hardware, the operating system, the compiler, uh, the code itself, the day of the week, the color of your socks, all of those things affect which one. But it, so the best you can do is we'll do the best we can. We'll do a little horse race to see which of these three scheduling approaches works best. And then we'll be wrong. And we accept that eh, it's the best guess. It's as good as we're going to get. All right. So you can actually put in your parallel do directive which schedule you want. You can say, all right. So I'd like this loop to do static, and I'd like this loop to do dynamic, and I'd like this loop to do guided. Or there's an extra one, which is none of those. It's called runtime. So if you set, if you say, I want the schedule to be runtime, that means go look at the value of OMP schedule, which is another environment variable like OMP numbers. Go look at the value of OMP schedule and use that for the schedule for this. And so you set OMP schedule to static or guided or dynamic. I'm not sure whether that's case sensitive or not. Um, so the safe thing to do is put it in all caps. Okay. Now I mentioned this idea of synchronization. Synchronization means we all wait until we're all waiting, and then we can all continue. Okay. So we stop until everyone stopped. And the reason you'd want to do that is to make sure that everybody has completed some task that the next thing we're going to do will depend on, right? So if the next thing we're going to do depends on the variables, the values of some set of variables, we better have finished calculating those variables before we get started on using them. So we hate synchronization, except that we love it. We hate it in the sense that it adds time overhead. We sit and wait for the last straggler to catch up. How many of you have a family member where if you're going on like a trip and you have to wait for them, it's going to be like an extra 20 minutes just to get out of the garage? How many of you have that? Okay, you know what I'm talking about, right? How many of you are that family? Okay, nobody's going to admit it. Okay, so Debbie admits she's that. <laughs> family member. So that's synchronization, right? Everybody has to be in the car before the car can leave, right? It's the same idea. So we hate synchronization, except that. We love it because after all, you can't get out of the garage until everyone's in the car. So you've got to wait. Sometimes you can't avoid synchronization. The alternative to synchronizing is getting the answer wrong. And remember, it doesn't help to get the wrong answer faster. Okay. So here's kind of an example of that, right? So um, here we've got to calculate all the values of y, of the y and x variables because in order to calculate, or I guess we just do one, in order to calculate Z, we've got to have all of one, right? Okay. So we need to have some synchronization to make sure that all the values of Y have been calculated, right? You gotta be, you gotta start here because there's no way to do any iteration of Z unless all of Y is done, okay? All right, so um, here's the good news. Uh, well, good, bad. Um, the parallel do or parallel for directive will automatically put in synchronization at the end of the loop that's being parallelized. So when you do this loop, no thread is going to start this loop 
until every thread has finished its iterations of the first loop. Okay. So, and that's just built into parallel do and parallel pull. Okay. So a barrier is a place where synchronization occurs. And with the parallel do or parallel for directive, what you get is the barrier is not explicitly stated with the directive. It's implied by the fact that you're using parallel do or parallel for directive. Okay. But there is actually also a barrier directive that you can put in explicitly if you need it. Okay. Now, a critical section is a place inside a parallel part of the code where you can't be parallel. Only one of you can do that thing at a time. Okay. So here, I've got a parallel loop, right? But inside the loop, only one of us can add something to that variable at a time, right? It doesn't matter the order that we do it. It doesn't matter who is doing it at any given time, but only one of us at a time. So again, this is one of those things where it adds a lot of time, but the alternative is getting the answer wrong. And it doesn't help to get the, the wrong answer fast enough. So same idea. Okay. And if you left out the critical section, as I said, you, you get the wrong answer. And this creates something called a race condition. And I swear you just volunteered to be on camera, didn't you? You totally did. Come on up. You're going to love this. It's so much fun. Actually, I need one more of you. Did you volunteer? OK, so the two of you come up. We're going to play an exciting game called the pen game. This is the first pen game. There are actually two pen games. Are you ready? Are you excited? Okay, come on up. You got to be right here. Okay, so here's how the pen game is played. I'm going to say one, two, three, go, and you take the pen. Ready? Uh, no, you want to beat her. You want to win. One, two, three, go. Oh, 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 you got to get it. Stick it up. Hurry it up. Hurry it up. Oh, you win. Okay, so you won. Yay. Give her a big hand. Yeah. No, no, no. We know. We're not done. You're going to have to try harder this time. Okay, are you ready? One, two, three, go. Oh, oh, did it again. Okay, put it back, put it back. We're gonna play again. One, two, three, go. Oh, you got it this time. Okay, so now we have demonstrated. Can I know in advance which of you is gonna win? Can I know what the outcome will be if I don't know who's gonna win? And I know who's gonna end up with the pen? No. If there's a right answer, if you're supposed to get the pen, can I guarantee that you will get the pen in this game? Yes. Well, she got it the first two times. Right? I can't promise anybody that you're always going to get it, right? Okay, so that's bad if you getting the pen is the correct outcome. No, no insult. If you getting the pen is the correct outcome, it's bad if I can't guarantee that outcome, right? Now we're going to play the second pen game. You're going to love this one, okay? This will be much more collaborative. So in the second pen game, I'm going to count one, two, three, go again. But this time, I want you to look at the pen when I say go. One, two, three, go. Okay, so did each of you get to look at the pen? Okay, let's play it again. One, two, three, go. Oh, did each of you get to look at the pen? We'll do it one more time. One, two, three, go. Did each of you get to look at the pen? Yeah. So when you're just observing the state of the pen, but not changing the state of the pen, then I can guarantee the correct outcome. But if you're changing the state of the pen, I can't guarantee the correct outcome. Um, and thank you very much, and you can go sit down again. And so we call that a race condition when two of you, two of the threads, are trying to change the value of some variable at the same time, either one of the threads could change the value, or the other of the threads could change the value, or at least in principle could happen that you both try to change the value at the same time. This would have been fun. We would be pulling on the pen. That would be really fun. Um, you could both be trying to change the value of that variable at the same time, in which case maybe you get a garbage result, not the result that either of you want. So that's bad. That's, we call that a race condition because you're racing to win the, the race. Um, and a race condition is almost automatic, is essentially automatically a bug. I can guarantee that at least some of the time you'll get the wrong answer. Right? Whatever the right answer is, it's not going to happen sometimes. So race conditions are very bad. It also turns out they're hard to debug, very difficult to debug a race condition. All right, I mentioned reductions a couple of times in the past. So reduction just means taking many data and turning it into fewer data, and in fact, typically into one piece of data. Okay, so for example, taking the sum of all the elements of an array. So 
So if you're calculating the mean or what have you, uh, that would be a, a reduction in taking the product. Um, if it's Booleans, find the and of all of them or the or of all of them, that sort of thing. Okay? They're so common, they're so important that every parallel processing thing has a way of expressing that. So in um, OpenMP, you have a reduction clause. So this says, um, I will be summing into a variable named total mass. And that's exactly what's going on here. I'm adding up the values of this mass array and putting them in the variable named total mass. Okay? This is equivalent to having an array of masses, one for each thread, for each of those threads adding up all of the values in that array. So we get a sort of a, a partial sum for each thread, and then at the end, adding up the values for those threads to get the ultimate total of all. Right? But it's much more compact, much less trouble to just express it. So reductions are super important, and that's why we always have a way of expressing this is a reduction. As we'll see in um, MPI next week, there's also a way in MPI to express that sort of all right, so here's the serial code. Uh, I've got some declarations. I've got some parallelizable work I want to do, and then some work that can't be parallelized, and some more parallel, and more serial, and so on and so forth. This is my code named Big Science. Okay. Here's how I might parallelize that. Um, I'll do, I'll parallelize the loops that can be parallelized, uh, and I'll otherwise leave that alone. What you end up, if you do it that way, is you end up with a ton of synchronization that you have to do, right? So you're constantly having everybody wait until everybody waits. Everybody waits until everybody's in the car. Okay? So a different way you could do this is you could parallelize on the outermost loop, and then inside that, you could be calling some routine that turns off parallelization when it's not needed can't be used, but everything else is parallelized by default. So um, this particular directive master means only thread zero is allowed to do this work. So when you get to the part that only thread zero should do, you say, well, only thread zero is allowed to do this, and everybody else sits idle while thread zero does its math. But you're not having nearly as much of the synchronization as you did in the previous version. Ah, and that's it. OK. I, how much did we go over? Just a few minutes? Just a few minutes. OK, that's pretty good. Any questions from TV land? What was that really long question that you started reading me at the beginning? It was a multi-part question. It is a slide deck. By the way, I'm very proud of us that we got through 110 slides in just over an hour. Had many pieces. Did it go away? Okay, then we won't worry about it. We'll pick it up next time or something. So how we can parallelize if we don't know in advance how many number of iterations Oh, such a great question. How do you parallelize if you don't know how many iterations there's going to be in some loop, right? And almost invariably, you don't know at compile time how many iterations the loop will be, right? What you want is the ability to have it be flexible. You want to have your, you know, your 3D array be nx by ny by nz and have those be inputs, right, at runtime. So the answer is you don't have to know because the beauty of the parallel do directive is that the parallel do directive, so let's say we don't give it a schedule um, attribute, so the uh, clause, then what it'll do is it'll impose the static schedule because that's the default and it'll impose the um the default way of breaking up the iterations which is um length divided by number of threads and it'll impose the chunking and so on or you can give it a schedule or a schedule and say oh we're going to do dynamic or whatever you can even say the chunk size and so it'll, it, it gets there's lots of flexibility on that right but it'll do all of that for you It'll figure that out for you, which iterations of this loop belong to which thread. Because the other thing that you don't know at compile time is how many threads you're going to get to your bottom, right? 
So that's something that will be set in that environment variable. Right? So, and I think it's the case that if you don't explicitly set the environment variable OMP num threads, I think it looks at how many cores are in that computer and it says that's how many you get. The alternative way to do it, of course, would be to say, if you don't tell me how many, then it's one, right? Which is not that interesting. Um, and you're not going to get a lot of speed about that. Um, but um, so you are absolutely correct. And the goal, I would argue, is to not know at compile time what the number of iterations is or the number of threads. And to have as much of the magic as possible be done by the OpenMP runtime system itself, which is all hidden from us, right? and not have to have any of that stuff stated explicitly in the code. And, and OpenMP will typically do that for you so that you don't have to spend a lot of time worrying about, well, you know, is this the right number of iterations, the right number of threads, and I have to hardwire this at compile time? No. Let OpenMP take care of it. Did, yeah, what do you mean? You have spoken repeatedly about the importance of testing. The importance of testing. Whether some optimization is working properly. Also, how the conditions on super Yes, so um, you want to be very careful because if you over optimize, you can get the wrong answer. And you can never know the right way to write the code to get the best optimization because that depends on conditions that are constantly changing. What environment would be a good place to do all of this testing? Uh, the best place to test it is on the machine you're going to run in production. So if you're going to be running it on Schooner, which is the supercomputer here at OU, do that testing on Schooner. If you're going to be running it on uh, uh, Stampede 2 at Texas Advanced Computing Center, one of the Exceed machines, one of the natural machines, then test it there. And if you do a test on Schooner and then you do runs on Stampede 2, there is an excellent chance that the decisions you made based on the tests on Schooner will totally be wrong for Stampede 2. And you should never use the benchmark data from another machine to make real life decisions about how to configure your runs on this machine. If you did benchmarks on that machine, don't use that. I mean, it can sort of inform in a vague way how you think about the benchmarks over on this machine, but run the benchmarks on the same machine you're going to do the real life production runs on. Because without that information, the problem is the machines are too different. And again, it's not just the hardware. It's the operating system, it's the compiler, it's the version of the code you're running, and again, the day of the week and the color of your songs. It's all these different factors, and you are much better off benchmarking on every machine you want to run production runs on before you do those production runs. Could something be tested using one node on a supercomputer and then extrapolated to multiple nodes? So yes and no. Can, can you test it on a single node on a supercomputer and extrapolate that information to multiple nodes? You can, but it's not a good idea. The reason it's not a good idea is the more different nodes, different computers you're running out at the same time, the more and more interesting kinds of parallel overhead start to crop up. And um, it is, there is typically not a simple relationship between the number of nodes and the nature of the parallel overhead. And there is definitely very little relationship between running on a single node versus running on many nodes, or for that matter, running on a single core and running on many cores just within a single computer. There, there isn't a simple relationship typically. And even if there is, you won't know that until you benchmark. Is there some minimum test condition necessary to make sure that things like parallelization and race conditions are working properly? OK, so I'm going to leave out race conditions for the moment. Um, so there's a difference between testing to see if you get the right answer and testing to see whether it's faster or how much faster it is. Testing to see whether you get the right answer, um, usually what you're dealing with is different um, amounts and kinds of optimization by the compiler. And in that case, what you want to be doing is start from, I'm not having the compiler do any optimization at all, so my code runs really slow, but gets the right answer. By the way, your code also has bugs in it, 
So it's still getting the wrong answer, but at least it's the answer you think it should be getting. Um, and then as you introduce higher levels of optimization by recompiling, um, you compare the output for um, the no optimization compiled to the output for each level of optimization until the output is wrong in some obvious way. If it differs from the original by some amount that, you're, that is beyond what you're willing to tolerate because they're not going to be identical. Even if it's getting the right answer, the definition of the right answer is complicated. So, um, so that's the issue of getting the right answer. The issue of is it running faster? Race conditions typically does, do not play into. If you've got race conditions, fix those before worrying about how fast it is. And it mostly is there some virtual environment that has been developed either specific to each supercomputer or something generalized, which can be used on a personal computer to test, to do tests like this? Totally not. There are simulators of various kinds of systems, but they aren't designed for the level of complexity you get when you have multiple servers um, and you have many choices of things like what is the interconnection network among those servers? What is the, um, do you have a parallel file system or what is the file system that you're doing the IO to? Uh, there's, there's so many different choices. Which version of the operating system are you using? Did you turn on the, what is it, Spectre and Meltdown uh, um, uh, patches for the, the security vulnerability? Did you turn that on the compute nodes or is that only on the login nodes? Some supercomputers have implemented that only on the login nodes. Here at OU, we're much more paranoid about it, so we implemented it on all the compute nodes as well. Um, that's going to affect performance too. And I mean, that was only released, what, a month, two months ago, right? There's no way, even if there were an emulator, there's no way it takes that into account. And what we saw in our own benchmarks and what we've seen from other people who've run their benchmarks is implementing those security patches does have, in some cases, a significant effect on performance. So no, there is no, there's no cheat to getting performance information. The only way to get performance information is to benchmark your code on the system you're going to run it on for production um, under circumstances that are as close to what you're going to do in production as possible. And as close to as possible is still pretty far away. One more question. Yes. This is from someone else. This is another subject. Good. On the last slide, when we say that we are requiring only master to work on a specific part of the code, is that similar to the example we gave earlier when we were working in the beginning and then yes. the, throat, the threads were sitting idle for the rest of the time? Or is this something else? Let's see if I can find that picture. And whenever we try to paralyze a loop, does a master fork at that time Fair. and create threads then? Right. So that last slide there, yes, in a sense, is an implementation of the not fork join, fork join, fork join, but the fork idle and keep keep the threads alive but idle until the end of the program. Yes, that, that's basically exactly what's going on here. And I lost it. Can you repeat the second part of the question? And let's see. And whenever we try to paralyze a loop, does the master fork at that time and create threads then? So I don't want to ever say whenever. <laughs> because some of this is implementation specific. So I don't believe the OpenMP standard says how it has to be implemented, although I'd have to dig into it farther to see for sure. Um, I think it just says what the behavior is supposed to be. Um, so it could be in theory, I think, and I, again, I'd have to go dig into the OpenMP standard to know for sure, but I suspect it's the case that, it, that, the, that, it, that the OpenMP standard does not address the question of what's really happening behind the curtain under the cover. What I suspect is it says, this is how it's supposed to behave, but that could be implemented by um, the fork being done automatically at the very beginning and the join being done automatically at the very end. That is a possibility. Um, the advantage of the approach that I showed in that last slide like slide 110 or something. I'm impressed that we got through all of those. Okay, uh, this one. 
The advantage of this is it get, gets rid of some of the parallel overhead costs. Now, what I didn't show you is there are cases where you might have to synchronize even if you're doing it this way. So there could be a, a barrier directive here, right? And you might be, in fact, I would say there's a high probability of that in many applications, that there would be some barrier directives in here for synchronization. Um, all of this stuff is hugely dependent on the specifics of A, what your code is trying to do, and B, how your code is trying to do that thing. Okay? Because ultimately, again, first, get the right answer, and then second, get it faster. If you're getting the wrong answer faster, that doesn't happen. Did that help? Any more questions? Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody out in TV land. And uh, we will see you next week for MPI.